Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Adenoff. I'm president of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, or DFCR. Uh, you all probably know about us. We are the premier, and as far as I know, the only physician group, uh, as well as uh, physician and other medical providers who are dedicated to the promotion and supporting cannabis legalization and its regulation with evidence-based facts. Uh, tonight is a really special treat for us, uh, board member and good friend and colleague, Peter, Peter Grinspoon will be talking to us. And I just wanna take a couple minutes to introduce Peter. As mentioned, he's a DFCR board member. He's a primary care physician at Mass General Hospital and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. He spent two years as an associate director of Massachusetts Physician Health Service, helping physicians with addiction and mental health issues, and has actually documented his own recovery in his memoir, Free Refills, A Doctor Confronts His Addiction. So he is well-versed both professionally and personally with the topic he's gonna to be talking about, um, opiates and cannabis use. He graduated with a BA in philosophy from Swarthmore College and then spent five years as the campaign director for the environmental group Greenspeace before entering medical school at Boston University School of Medicine. He completed his residency at Harvard's Brigham Women's Hospital in the primary care program. He's been on national television all over the place um, very frequently and has been written about widely and writes widely. Uh, personally, I've gotten to know Peter over the last uh, few years on the board of DFCR. And he's, he's a wonderful guy, wonderful speaker. I found him initially coming as I did uh, straight from full-time academia to be kind of a bit more opinionated. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess opinionated is the best word than I was used to. And I may be a little impatient. And initially I, I struggle with it, but as I've been in the advocacy space more and in DFCR more, I, I now understand his impatience. And in fact, I, I find him a bit cautious now at times. Um, I, I've been surprised by the wealth of information that he, he's uh, knowledgeable of and how well read he is of the scientific literature regarding cannabis. So without anything more, uh, let's hear from Peter. I'm Peter Grinspoon, and I'm here to talk about medical cannabis and the opiate crisis. Um, no competing commercial interests. Um, just a brief history with the issue. I've essentially been involved with cannabis issue my entire life. My brother Danny was an early adopter of medical cannabis. He fought an unsuccessful battle with leukemia um, in the early 1970s. And my parents, right when Nixon started his war on drugs, my parents uh, procured cannabis for him illegally. And I saw firsthand as a little kid how it alleviated his suffering. I mean, when my brother Danny wasn't using cannabis, he was basically lying in his room throwing up. And when he was using cannabis, he could eat and most importantly, play with his little twin brothers. So, I mean, there's nothing more impactful than seeing um, the alleviation of suffering in a family member. Um, furthermore, my dad was a, which I'll get into, was a, a cannabis scholar and activist, Dr. Lester Grinspoon. We're actually having a big event for him on Friday, which is free at UMass Amherst, uh, a full day conference, which is going to be really cool. He was a pioneer in cannabis and in psychedelics. Um, he wrote a book called Marijuana Reconsidered that was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review in 1971, and a critical book in 1993 called Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine. He toiled uh, tirelessly for 50 years working on legalizing cannabis and advancing the cause of psychedelics. Um, I also have treated patients with medical cannabis my entire career. Literally for about 20 years, I've been treating patients. It's become a lot easier now that it's actually legal to do so. But, um, and as um, Brian mentioned, I, I am 14 years now, 14 or 15 years now in recovery from opiate addiction. So I feel like I understand pretty well the nexus between cannabis and opiates and how cannabis can and can't help with the opiate crisis, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, 
just here's a picture of my dad, obviously in the left. And this is a, a great activist, Steve Mandilli on the right. He is a veteran activist. He's a whole long story that I could talk about. But this is my dad on the front page of the Boston Globe smoking a joint. I'm like, <laughs> what next? But actually, it was the first cannabis, the first joint sold in Massachusetts legally. Um, and they sold it to Steve Mandilli, the veteran. He wanted to smoke it with my dad um, because my dad had been working on this for 50 years. And my dad, I'm so glad that he got to live. He passed away about two years ago, but I'm so glad that he got to live to see, at least in his home state where he grew up, cannabis being legalized. Um, it's a strain of Jack Herrera, fittingly, because he's another uh, very legendary cannabis activist. And I just like to remind people, I bet the audience here already knows, but cannabis was a very mainstream and legitimate medicine um, until 1937 when they passed the Marijuana Tax Act. I mean, this is a tincture by Park Davis and Company. They're owned by Pfizer. And it wasn't very controversial to use it as a medicine. So when we talk about legalizing cannabis, we're actually talking about re-legalizing cannabis. Um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, more than 100 scientific papers were published about cannabis as, as a medicine in the United States. Um, and I, I'd like to um, start off by just uh, highlighting some of the safety concerns before we talk about the benefits and the ways in which we could use it. Um, you know, teens, everybody's concerned about, though, fortunately, the rate, rates have been very stable with legalization. Storage is very important. You don't want little kids or uh, pets to get into to the cannabis. Um, this is just low-hanging fruit, I think, for the legalization movement. And we give ourselves a self-inflicted injury when we make these gummy bears and then have the kids overdose on them. Uh, driving, you know, when you're drunk, you're about 14 times the risk of getting into an accident. And when you're high, you're about twice as, twice as likely to get into an accident. They say that people who are drunk barrel through a red and people who are high stop at a green light. Uh, but you know, twice the risk, it's much safer than alcohol, but twice the risk is a really big deal. You could end up killing somebody and ruining their lives and going to prison. So it's like not at all suggested that anybody drive while using any intoxicating substance. Um, we really don't know that cannabis is safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, as a primary care doctor for 25 years, I'm very concerned about this. Now, some people certainly need it during pregnancy. They have very severe hyperemesis gravidarum. The medications we give them in the hospital are like also very sort of toxic. So, you know, I don't, I think it's all relative and this is gonna come up later. It's like, what is the least dangerous thing that we could be using? And often cannabis is uh, the answer to that. Um, cognition is so debated and I'm talking about in adults and even um, Nora Volkow, the, the head of NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse recently said that she doesn't believe there's any harm in occasional, adults occasionally using a modest amount of cannabis. Uh, it's been so pushed and exaggerated on this issue. And I just mentioned Stacy Gruber's work. Uh, she's at McLean Hospital and she did this really groundbreaking study called The Grass is Greener, where she showed that, um, that uh, cognition actually decreased in patients who were using it recreationally, but improved in patients who are using it medically. Um, and that's a whole another talk about why the cognition will be better. Is it because they use more CBD or the patients were older or is it because they um, were sleeping better and not suffering from as much chronic pain, but they did better on their cognitive testing. Um, now cannabis has never been associated with cancer or COPD, but it does cause a chronic bronchitis. And you know, intuitively these chem combustion chemicals just can't be good for you. So if someone needs to take it inhalationally, I always recommend a dry herb vaporizer. And then cardiac people are gonna debate until the end of time. Psychiatric people are gonna debate until the end of the time. You know, the psychiatrists say, aha, this person is depressed. They're using cannabis. The cannabis causes depression. And everybody else says, well, they're using cannabis because it's they're depressed and it helps them. So that's just a debate that's that's not settled yet. Um, and then finally, medication um, interactions are very important. For example, CBD, everybody thinks is harmless. One in seven Americans are taking um, something with CBD in it. One in three Americans have tried CBD. And um, it acts exactly like grapefruit juice. It uh, competitively inhibits the liver enzyme. So it can raise the level of other medications in your blood. So you just have to be careful if you're taking, for example, a blood thinner that needs to be in a narrow therapeutic window. 
And then finally, dependency and addiction. Uh, some people absolutely get um, addicted to cannabis. It's not the 30% that Deborah Hassan says in her reports, 30% of adult users. Um, but it's also not zero. I mean, I treat people for cannabis addiction. Um, and I think the, what the problem is the way cannabis use disorder is defined, which is sort of synonymous with addiction, essentially, um, they include tolerance, withdrawal, and cravings. And they shouldn't include that because that ropes in all of the medical patients and vastly inflates the numbers of people that are quote unquote addicted to cannabis. Also, a lot of people historically have been sent into treatment from the courts. You know, kid gets in trouble. They say, the judge says to the parents, do you want your kids to go to juvie or to treatment? And they're like, treatment, of course, anybody would pick that. And then they need a diagnosis. So they use the diagnosis, cannabis addiction. So historically that's very much inflated the numbers for that too. We really don't know how many people get addicted to cannabis at this point. But cannabis, chronic pain, and the opiate crisis. Um, you know, the pain, people don't really love cannabis. I don't know whether it's like old fart syndrome or professional competition. They're worried about not being able to do as many injections or whether it's just that they, um, you know, aren't exposed to like all of the studies that are coming out. I mean, even the the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in 2017, a US government organization said that cannabis works for, for several types of pain. And the IASP says, due to the lack of high quality clinical evidence, the International Association for the Study of Pain does not currently endorse general use of cannabis and cannabinoids for pain relief. Therefore, we have to do expensive injections. Oh, wait, they didn't actually say that. But they also did, to their credit, say, we do not wish to dismiss the lived experience of people with pain who have found benefit from their use. This is not a door closing on the topic, but rather a call for more rigorous and robust research. So that's more reasonable. I think the second statement came a little bit after the first, after they got a lot of pushback. But anyways, before we talk about opiates and cannabis, it's important to just discuss the question of evidence. What's the right lens to look for benefit or harm and what counts as evidence? Um, they've just used randomized controlled trials to, um, they won't accept anything else but these placebo controlled, double blinded randomized controlled trials as proof of evidence for cannabis's efficacy. And uh, first of all, uh, this was not funded by the government. It, no studies into benefit were funded, just studies into harm. So there are very few studies that are randomized controlled trials. Second of all, there are a lot of problems with randomized controlled trials. And third of all, it's hard to blind cannabis. Most people know if they've been given cannabis versus a placebo because they're stoned. I mean, that's why people take cannabis. So um, real world evidence is defined as evidence from health data source from non-interventional studies, registries, electronic health records, and insurance data, including patient recorded outcomes. Interestingly, the medical profession traditionally has thought that this uh, standard of evidence was perfectly good to talk about the harms of cannabis, because nobody does a randomized control trial. You give some teens cannabis, you give some teens placebo and see if their IQ goes down. I mean, real world evidence has been fine to criticize cannabis, but they've really sort of beaten the medical cannabis proponents over the head with the lack of randomized controlled trials. And a lot of people are way more open to real world evidence these days, because uh, first of all, cannabis is still schedule one. It's very difficult to study in this country. And, and second of all, we use real world evidence all the time in medicine, everywhere. So why wouldn't we use it for cannabis? Um, so for example, here's a different study by Stacy Gruber. She's at my, my hospital. Well, she's at a different hospital, McLean, at my institution at Harvard. And this is just an example of like, they gave some people cannabis and they gave other people not cannabis. And, you know, um, relative to baseline following three and six months of treatment, medical cannabis patients exhibited improvements in pain, which were accompanied by improved sleep, mood, anxiety, and quality of life, and stable conventional medicine use. Um, reduced pain was associated with improvements in mood and anxiety. I mean, how, in what planet is this not evidence? This is like a rigorous study by like one of the most uh, respected researchers at Harvard. And like, you know, the International Association for the Society of Pain would say, oh, no evidence. This isn't a randomized controlled trial. So I think there's a really sort of hypocritical double standard as to what people consider to be evidence and what they don't. Um, and this just makes a point that I said before, and that the government has 
only funded studies into harm, not into benefit. In 2018, research on the potential harms of cannabis received more than 20 times more funding than research on therapeutics. Now, this is 2018. Imagine what it was like in 1975 with Robert DuPont, the head of NIDA, um, and you know this whole you know, war in cannabis going on. So very little money has gone into studying the benefits of cannabis. And we have to factor that in when we're looking at the database, because it's sort of like the home run hitter who took steroids. He, you know, he is the champion in hitting home runs, but he was on steroid. Like there are steroids. There are all these studies about cannabis, but the question is how scientific is it if instead of saying, is this harmful or beneficial? You say, this is harmful. Let's prove that it's harmful. That, that is not science if you ask me. So it's the real question how we're going to deal with the whole a canon of scientific literature that was funded and essentially directed by the war on drugs. Uh, fortunately, we're coming out of that age, but uh, again, it's still schedule one and very hard to do research on, on cannabis. For those of you that don't know, schedule one is for medicines or for substances with no medical utility and a high abuse liability. Uh, cannabis doesn't fit into either of those can can categories. So in terms of the opiate crisis, this has been a disaster. We've had 108,000 deaths in the last 12 months. You know, and what, what are the risks for opiate harms? Obviously, if you're using opiates, you're gonna overdose. And if you're not using them, you're not gonna overdose. A lot of people got unnecessarily put on opiates over the last couple of decades. Everybody's heard about Purdue pharmaceuticals. Interestingly, like many of the addictions come not from people taking opiates as prescribed, but because we prescribed, we being doctors prescribed so many opiates they were just sitting around medicine cabinets and people would just get into them and would get very addicted. Um, I believe that uh, cannabis is about as effective as opiates for chronic pain, unless it's very severe pain. If it's very severe pain or acute pain, like a broken bone or post-surgical, you're gonna need an opiate, but they're pretty comparable for chronic pain, like the mild to moderate chronic pain that Americans are getting as they get sort of older and portlier and more arthritic. But clearly, opiates have a worse quality of life, Not aside from the fact that you could overdose on them. Um, so many studies with cannabis show improved qualities of li quality of life. Um, I just want to make the point that cutting people off opiates is not the answer. That's how our government has gone about addressing the opiate overdose crisis. Let's cut off the supply of opiates. And all that does is make people buy the opiates in the street where they're more likely to be contaminated with fentanyl. And that's why the overdose, part of why the overdoses are going up. So we have to be compassionate about this, compassionate to people in chronic pain, not just cut them off their opiates. Um, I'm going to skip this one just for the, um, for the sake of time. Now, there are five ways in which cannabinoids can supplant opiates and thus can reduce harm and can help chip away at the opiate epidemic, four of which I support and one of which I don't. And I'm gonna save the one that I don't for the very end. The first one is you start new chronic pain patients on cannabis instead of opiates. Again, if it's very severe pain, you might need opiates. Some people need opiates. I mean, they're a critical medicine for some people, but not for as many people as are currently getting them. Um, you know, especially for, as I mentioned, worse, worsening osteoarthritis, but also, uh, you know, end of life care, neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, the very good evidence coming out of Israel for fibromyalgia. But as a primary care doctor, I'm seeing so many patients whose kidneys are dying um, after years of uh, non-steroidal use. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if we should be using low-dose cannabinoids instead of non-steroidal. It's not the occasional Naperson or Advil, but for people that need to take them three times a day, I'm wondering if cannabis is actually a lot safer than these other medications. Um, there are some studies to uh, support this. Um, between 2011, I'm sorry, this is so small, between 2011 and 2018, um, they looked at prescriptions and um, with, met, with recreational and medical cannabis access laws, the number of morphine milligram equivalents prescribed each year reduced by 11.8% with recreational use and 4.2% with medical use. Uh, a lot of people go to recreational dispensaries and use the cannabis medically. There's a lot of overlap, but that's an incredible, that's a huge, I mean, most of the harm with opiates is dose related. And if you could lower the morphine 
gram equivalents that much. That's really amazing, a 10% drop. Um, in fact, in Colorado, they found that prescriptions across the board went down when they legalized cannabis, uh, saving hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, I think that people just took a puff instead of waiting to see their doctor for a month and then getting a muscle relaxant, which makes them groggy, or they would use take a puff instead of trying Viagra or instead of aspirin or ibuprofen or morphine. I think people are substituting all over the place uh, these other medications for cannabis. Um, the second way in which cannabinoids can supplant opiates, you can transition patients who are on opiates for chronic pain to cannabis. Again, tons of people are on uh, opiates for chronic pain because of our overprescription and the kind of overselling of opiates. Um, there's very not very good data for chronic pain on opiates. People are physically dependent, so they if they miss a dose, they have a lot of pain and withdrawal symptoms. So they then they take a dose and they feel better. So they think it's really effective for chronic pain, but there's really not very good evidence. Now the key to this is that it has to be voluntary. The other key to this is that they have to be able to afford the medical cannabis because health insurance often doesn't pay. I've had some, a couple of patients who have gotten completely off Percocet and benzodiazepines. And then after a couple of months, they're like, doc, I was doing much better in the cannabis, but you know, with my mass health insurance, the perks cost me a dollar a month and the cannabis was costing me a hundred dollars a month. I just can't afford it. Um, I did have a lot of success stories that I could talk about, but I'm going to skip over the success stories um, to save time. But I do have one, one patient that was just a disaster on opiates. And now he's like getting a degree in economics. And he said the only reason he was able to get out of the opiate fog and pull his life together, he used to be a gang member, was because I encouraged him to switch from the, from the opiates to the cannabis. I mean, it's really just drastic, the change you can see in the quality of life. And part of it's too that people on opiates are treated so poorly these days. They're treated like criminals. So part of it is that the quality of life is better just because we dump on people who are on opiates. Now, this is a just a great article. It's, it's very small, but I'll make my slides available to anybody who's interested. It just talks about how you go about trans, transitioning people from chronic opiate opioid therapy to cannabis. And there was a 67.1% average decrease in daily morphine milligram equivalents from 49.9 to 16.4 at the first follow-up and a 73% decrease at the second follow-up. I mean, this is how we're going to stop the overdose crisis. People are using, are able to substitute cannabis for opiates. Um, now, the other thing is, um, people are like self-substituting. This is um, cannabis use was associated, this is an ecological study. Cannabis use was associated with 64% lower opiate use in patients with chronic pain. And again, like all studies, this is cannabis was associated with a better quality of life. Now, if it's lowered 64% by patients themselves, imagine how much we could lower it if doctors were primary care doctors, all doctors, we're educated sensibly about cannabis and we're using this as a tool to help people. It could really be transformational in terms of addressing the opiate crisis. Um, the third way is that sometimes you can't get people completely off the opiates, but you could use cannabis um, to lower the dose of opiates. They co-work um, on, the same, on the same receptors. There's sort of a one plus one equals three reaction. If you give someone like two and a half milligrams of oxycodone, they don't get any pain relief. And if you give them a teeny bit of cannabis, they don't get any pain relief. But if you give them both in subtherapeutic doses together, they work synergistically and they help with pain. And um, you can get up to an 80% dose reduction in opiates if you use cannabis along with opiates. And cannabis is perfectly safe to use along with opiates because it doesn't cause respiratory depression. The cannabinoid receptors are everywhere in the brain except on the brainstem. They don't suppress your breathing. So it does not increase your chance of overdose. Um, and again, most of the harm and danger of chronic, chronic opiate use is dose related. So this is a harm reduction gold mine. Um, the fourth way, let's take a sip here, is that you could use cannabis for opiate withdrawal symptoms. This is not only evidence based, but I have personal experience with this. It's way better than whatever they give you, clonidine or lofexidine. When you're 
withdrawing from opiates, you have like nausea, anxiety, depression, stomach cramping, diarrhea. You can't sit still. You're like restless. You have insomnia. You feel like you're crawling out of your skin. And cannabis really helps with almost all of these symptoms. Clonidine just slows your heart rate down a little bit and stops a little bit of the agitation. Um, it's just hard to find someone who is in recovery for opiate addiction who doesn't agree that cannabis is helpful. The only people that think it isn't helpful are the addiction psychiatrists that are like very much against it. And I just completely disagree on this point. Um, we should not even be testing for cannabis in opiate treatment programs. Um, this is based just on stigma and racism, uh, not on clinical care. And to kick people out of any kind of treatment, opiate treatment, pain clinics for cannabis use is like flatly unethical. Uh, patients don't do worse and they often do better. And, and again, this is evidence-based. Uh, this was a meta-analysis. They studied 41 different studies. And in most studies, the cannabis use did not significantly predict treatment outcomes. Um, a few studies showed better outcomes. A few studies showed worse outcomes. But in the context of that, this has been studied for harm and not for benefit. This is an astounding finding. And then furthermore, um, if you look at naturalistic studies and people self-reporting their symptoms of opiate withdrawal, just, just uh, coincident with my experience, cannabis alleviates self-reported opiate withdrawal symptoms. Anxiety was the most common opiate withdrawal syndrome improved with cannabis. Um, so most people find this like highly effective. And I would just bet anybody like a cup of coffee or something that this is going to be standard of care. Some kind of cannabinoid is going to be standard of care for opiate withdrawal symptoms within the next five years. Um, now, the one way that I don't 100% agree with um, in which cannabis can help supposedly stop the opiate crisis is more controversial. You know, we have excellent data for methadone and buprenorphine or suboxone. With buprenorphine or suboxone, we have a demonstrated 50 to 80 percent drop in overdose rates and death. So even though I've heard from thousands of patients uh, that have used cannabis to get off heroin or other opiates, as a prescriber, it makes me nervous to say, why don't you use cannabis if you're addicted rather as a primary therapy as opposed to just prescribing them buprenorphine, which is what I do in practice. Now, it's obviously up to them if they want to try just using cannabis. And I'm delighted for them to use cannabis as an adjunct, but I'm just not convinced it could be the primary treatment to get people off opiates until there's some evidence that it's safe and effective. Now, I haven't seen any evidence that it's not safe or effective either. I haven't heard of studies showing people use cannabis have higher overdose death. So we haven't seen that, but the stakes are so high. Um, you know, it's all a question of context. If someone comes to me with a migraine, I'm like, sure, I'll try medical cannabis. The worst case scenario is that the cannabis won't work and we'll try something else, sumatriptan for the migraine. But the stakes are so high that I would feel very nervous doing this. Um, the problem is who's going to study it? Like there's no big pharma incentive. Why study something that people can grow on their own at home? And the cannabis industry, this is one of the areas where they've been getting a little bit of... Um, criticism for potentially making irresponsible claims. Because, you know, for example, you don't wanna say cannabis cures cancer. Cannabis is an adjunct to, can to cancer treatment. You don't wanna say cannabis cures addiction. It should be an adjunct. And some of these places are advertising that they can cure opiate addiction. And I could see why the, they're uh, getting a little bit of criticism for this. Um, so does medical cannabis prevent overdose deaths? It's a little bit too early to tell. The prohibitionists are running around saying, look, overdose deaths are going up, but there's a pandemic, everything's going up. That's like the dumbest argument I've ever heard in my life. Uh, it's just too early to tell and the data is equivocal, but it's really hard to imagine if you're using fewer opiates, you're prescribing fewer opiates. Cannabis is also really good for getting people off gabapentinoids and benzodiazepines, um, all those other medications. I mean, most overdoses are, Polypharma polypharmacy, it's not just the opiate, a bunch of stuff is in there. And as I mentioned before, cannabis does not contribute to overdoses because it doesn't suppress your breathing. There are no receptors in the brainstem. So it's really hard to imagine that cannabis is not helping 
uh, for all of these reasons, though there isn't one good study that shows overdoses have gone down. But again, we're in the midst of this pandemic and our healthcare system is in sort of a slow collapse. If anybody, if you haven't noticed, like the doctors are dropping like flies, the nurses are dropping like flies, the emergency departments are disasters. So it's not a stable environment for which to see if the overdoses are, are going down as we legalize cannabis. Eventually, I'm convinced we're going to show this. Um, but, you know, my suggestion is going back or uniting the discussion about like, what is evidence and what is responsible medical practice? Maybe the level of evidence that we require um, should be related to how harmful the condition is. Again, a migraine is not harmful. Sure, try medical cannabis, um, back pain, sciatica. But, you know, if someone's going to ask you if it cures leukemia, you have to have like really hardcore evidence because you could harm someone. If they use cannabis instead of chemotherapy, you're harming them in the absence of data. And the same is true, as I mentioned very recently, you know, just in the last slide with opiates, we just don't have the evidence to take people directly from heroin addiction to medical cannabis patient, except as an adjunct. So I wonder if we should just calibrate it's not all or nothing, but calibrate the level of evidence that we need to the harms, the level of harm there is in the condition that we're treating. Um, why are doctors so slow to adopt cannabis? This I give a whole lecture on, but there's a cultural bias, i.e. they've been brainwashed by 50 years of nonsense on the war on drugs. Um, my dad's book called that out in 1971, and it's been going on ever since. Um, there's very conflicting information which sort of paralyzes people when they hear two different stories, they don't know what to believe. It would require a paradigm shift. It requires ceding a lot of control to patients. You know, if I give someone a blood pressure medication, it's like take 10 milligrams of lisinopril and let's check it in a month. You know, if you certify someone for cannabis, they go and talk to a bud tender and it's trial and error. It's just a very big paradigm shift for doctors. Uh, some are very intimidated or slash hiding behind the federal illegality. And then the, again, there's a big, um, big fight over the, the types of data, real world data versus randomized controlled trials. So this is going to shift. 68.9% um, of doctors think the cannabis is medicine. That's less than the 94% of Americans who support legal access to medical cannabis. But doctors are coming along they're heading in the right direction, especially the younger doctors. Um, one challenge is that the medical education, they only teach the endocannabinoid system in 13% of medical schools. And uh, the continuing medical education is awful on cannabis. I went to a conference associated with my institution and I was just shocked at how bad it was. And the people they get, some of the people they get are just like awful. Um, I don't mean to be critical, but the, if you're gonna not teach someone about the endocannabinoid system, and then you're going to feed them nonsense, they're never going to become comfortable with this medication. And then they become dismissive of it as a way to hide their lack of knowledge. And then the patients don't feel comfortable talking to the doctors. And then you get this two different uh, care systems, one, the medical cannabis care system, and one, the medical uh, system. And people don't tell their doctors because they don't feel comfortable. And then it's very dangerous in terms of drug interactions. So the way things are now really has to change. It's very dangerous and suboptimal. So we need less stigma, better education of healthcare professionals. This is crucial. The doctors are saying, how can they talk to bud tenders about cannabis? How could they get advice from the bud tenders about medical issues? But then when the patient goes to the doctor, the doctor doesn't know anything. So you can't criticize patients for getting information somewhere else if you can't provide it yourself. And patients don't really have good sources of information right now. Uh, we need better communication between doctors and patients, and we need less politicized, uh, politicized make the issue less politicized. Um, just a couple equity issues. As I mentioned, health insurance doesn't pay for medical cannabis. That has to change because medical cannabis can't just be, especially with the history of like social injustice and prohibition, can, medical cannabis can't just be for the well-to-do especially many elderly and veterans who are living on fixed incomes is really hard to afford. So what I hope for the future, just a couple of closing thoughts, because I know uh, Brian's gonna boot me in a few minutes. Um, I wish cannabis were better integrated into mainstream medicine and that's happening a little bit every year. 
I wish there was universal access for patients and that they could have it paid for so that they don't have to scrimp or decide between cannabis and other medications. We need to dismantle the stigma. We're working on that. It gets dismantled automatically if patient, as patients have successful experiences and people see their family members suffering less, sort of like I saw my brother Danny suffering less. It really sears into your brain that cannabis is a helpful thing. We need much more education. It's just shameful that we're not teaching the endocannabinoid system. I mean, that's the system of receptors and neurotransmitters in our brains and bodies, which cannabis sort of hijacks, but which has been around for millions of years. Now it controls our body's ability to regulate itself. And um, even if you're against cannabis, it's crazy not to teach this in medical schools. It's like not teaching the neuro norepinephrine system. It, it just, it's like nuts. Um, we need to take off the fetters to scientific research. It needs to be out of schedule one, you know, where it has no medical utility and high abuse potential. That's got to change immediately. And then, you know, I think cannabis, begrudgingly, they're starting to say, well, you can try this, 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 and this. And if that doesn't work, you could try cannabis as a last resort. But just as I mentioned earlier with the non-steroidals, I think the cannabis has to move up earlier on our diagnostic, on our treatment algorithm, because again, so many of my patients in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, their kidneys are just failing because of all the non-steroidals. And this could be avoided if we use cannabis instead. Um, I think the role of cannabis in harm reduction and end of life care needs to be rapidly expanded. I mean, um, this is a long story, but when my father passed away, of course, he didn't have to twist my dad's arm of all people to use cannabis, but he, we only needed three doses of morphine to get him from this world to the next world. And he was so much more interactive and alert than he would have been if he were just drugged out of morphine. I mean, you could really improve the quality of life of the end of life. Um, I hope cannabis becomes legalized, not just medically, but for adult use, because it's a fine line between adult use and medical use. And if people are enhancing their spiritual, sexual lives, they're finding creativity and joy, they're finding facilitated interpersonal connection, they're gonna be happier and healthier people. Um, and then finally, we just need a lot less polarization around this issue. Um, I'm coming out with a book in, in April, which is hoping to accomplish just that. Um, and I'd like to close with a famous, a quote by a famous advocate of medical cannabis, Carl Sagan. He was a family friend. He was always in our household. This is a picture of him teaching me to read. I always joke about how it's a picture of me teaching him how to read. But anyways, he wrote a chapter in my dad's book, uh, Marijuana Reconsidered in 1971. He wrote it under the name Mr. X because he was not out of the cannabis closet. He worked for NASA, you know, he was an astronomer and an astrobiologist and they would have taken away his funding. So he was Mr. X until he died. And then my dad said, well, actually Mr. X was my friend, Carl Sagan. And he said, the illegality of cannabis is outrageous. An impediment to the full utilization of a drug which helps produce the serenity and insight, sensitivity and fellowship so desperately needed in this incredibly, in this increasingly mad and dangerous world. Amen to that. And um, I think I'm out of time here. So thank you for listening. Um, you know, I really enjoy working at Doctors for Cannabis Regulation where we're trying to not only legalize cannabis in the places where it's not legalized, but also educate doctors. And um, these are a couple of different ways in which you could reach me. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian, assuming he's still awake. I am very much awake. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, I, I, I'm kind of stuck on the idea of having Lester Grinspoon is my dad and Carl Sagan <laughs> hanging around the house. Um, that must have been a fascinating childhood, Peter. It was fascinating. Never a dull moment. I mean, I didn't realize until I was like in my mid-teens yeah. that your average household didn't have cannabis smoke billowing out of the chimney um, as, as just like routine business. Yeah. Um, well, um, so uh, great questions here. Brian Chadwick, please ask, says, uh, please ask Peter to discuss smoking alternatives that are fast acting, sublingual, intranasal, fast acting edibles? Well, the technology is really changing. Um, I mean, again, if you're gonna use it inhalationally, 
that's immediate. And the safest way to do that is to get a dry herb vaporizer because with smoking, you heat it up to like 1100 degrees and you get the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and the benzene and the tar. But to extract the cannabinoids, you only have to heat it up to 400 degrees. So these dry herb vaporizers, it tastes better, uh, it's safer, it's better for your lungs, and it's more economical because you don't use lose half of it inside smoke. So anybody who's using it inhalationally, I say, uh, use a dry herb vaporizer. But the tinctures act in about 20 to 30 minutes. You know, you have to really hold them under your tongue for a minute or two. And then after that, whatever you don't absorb under your tongue, um, you swallow and that gets absorbed as a regular edible, which is like an hour to an hour and a half. But miraculously, the technology is really advancing. Like these seltzers they have now hit you in like five minutes. I think they use like nanoparticles and they just get absorbed directly. They don't have to like go through your GI system and then get metabolized into your liver and then turn into Delta 11 instead of Delta 9 THC, which makes people a little more spaced out. Like these seltzers are so quick acting. So I think we're really on the, the dawn of an age of like really fast acting oral cannabinoids. Um, I didn't believe it, but then I tried one at a party and it was like five minutes later, it was like, Phew. so we actually have a lot of patients really like these seltzers and they're really quick and they only have like five milligrams of THC in them. And then, um, you know, there's so many more delivery devices like um, suppositories, rectal or, or vaginal can be really good for endometriosis or pelvic pain. And those are pretty quick. Um, you know, topicals can be pretty quick too. So there's a wide variety these days of um, delivery devices. And it's funny that people, a lot of these prohibitionists think that people just sit around and smoke it. But I think a lot of people take advantage of these other devices that are a lot safer. Thanks. I hadn't heard about some of those. So that's very interesting. Uh, Ken Wolski asked in medical cannabis states like New Jersey, there should be medical edu mandatory education of the endocannabinoid system for all healthcare professionals who have prescription privileges as a condition for continued licensure. What do you think? Well, not just in medical cannabis states, like all doctors have to know this stuff. I mean, the endocannabinoid system does so many things. Um, it's like how it's hard to imagine being like an effective doctor without knowing about it. Again, this is one of the main neurotransmitter systems in our brains and our bodies that controls homeostasis. It controls the body's ability to regulate itself. It controls memory, fear, learning, appetite, hunger, temperature, um, weight. It just, it's crazy that we don't, that we don't teach it. So I think it needs to be taught in all medical schools. Um, you know, and it's interesting, like Ethan Russo, who's a very famous neurologist who's been in the cannabis space for decades, he posits that some of the diseases that we're really bad at treating in regular Western medicine, like migraine or uh, fibromyalgia or you know irritable bowel syndrome, are because of a relative endocannabinoid deficiency, and that that's why cannabinoids are so effective in alleviating symptoms for these conditions. And you know, you you could never even understand that theory if you don't know what the endocannabinoid system is. So I agree with you, Ken, except I would make it stronger that like it should be mandatory for all doctors to learn this. I don't know about like conditioning, prescribing rights on it, because, you know, they're already torturing doctors enough over the opiates. But I think that it absolutely has to be part of the curriculum of like every single medical school and part of continuing medical education. You know, along those lines, Peter, I, I had a reporter from STAT ask me this today, that some states were, it was suggested, I think, in New York, that any any physician that's certified to be, uh, to recommend cannabis needs eight hours, and it got lowered to two. And who's, do you know who is lobbying against eight hours and, to, you know, to decrease the time? I don't know, but honestly... Two hours is plenty, um, as long as it's good education. Uh, you can't kill anybody with cannabis. I mean, we are required to have zero hours for opiates or benzos. Um, I mean, you have to keep that in context. And I do think the two hours is really important, but um, the way you learn about this stuff, like all things in medicine is by doing and by re reading and talking to people. So I think there's only so much. I mean, to make a doctor sit for a full day uncompensated for some expensive course, like doctors are just not going to be interested. They're, again, doctors are dropping like flies. Uh, this epidemic of 
a burnout. So I, I have a hard, hard time like increasing the burden on doctors because they're really suffering. But I do think cannabis education is important. So I think mandatory like two hours, four hours is, it is good. I think it's the doctors I've seen that have done that have been have been fine. Of course, it is a little self-selecting because the doctors that recommend cannabis are sort of the ones that are interested in it and learning about it anyways. Thanks. Um, yeah, those are interesting points. Uh, Ariel, uh, it's a comment. Um, I like your comment on it. Some of the most interesting studies I've seen about anti-malignancy properties of whole plant cannabis extracts are when used as targeted treatment at the site of malignant growth to make radiation treatment more effective and less harmful to healthy tissue. Uh, any comments on that or do you know well, about that at all? In the lab, cannabinoids are incredibly effective at killing cancer cells by a whole wide variety of mechanisms. You know, they, uh, the anti-angiogenesis, meaning they starve off the blood vessels, they uh, trigger apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, so the cells are no longer immortal, they kill themselves, it prevents metastases. Um, so I think that cannabis is going to have a huge role eventually in different cannabinoids in cancer treatment. But these studies have all been either preclinical or in animals and very few human studies. There's like one study that CBD helps prolong survival with glioblastoma multiforme. But so I think the research is really interesting, but it makes me a little bit nervous because we haven't shown clinically that this is effective yet. And, um, you know, like my a friend of mine's an Alzheimer's researcher and he says that things look good in animal trials, but they can rarely turn into treatments for humans. And that's why we have a million treatments for Alzheimer's and animals, but like one or two for humans. And I worry that if the message gets out that like cannabis causes cancer, uh, people are gonna run with it and use it instead of chemotherapy. There was this famous case in Oregon where this woman took her uh, 13 year old son out of treatment for a solid tumor in his leg and started treating him with CBD. And the state said, you have to bring him back and put him back in treatment. And I agreed with the state. I mean, she was gonna kill this kid just treating him with CBD. And that's not fair. Sorry, my dog is going berserk here. Um, you're gonna kill this kid using just CBD. So um, I do think it's really, the potential is really astounding and it's gonna be really interesting. You know, David Neary in Israel is studying different strains and how they kill melanoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. So the potential is definitely there, but I don't think we're quite there yet uh, at the clinical level. Thanks. Uh, Deandra Psyche, I, I know Deandra, I should know how to pronounce your last name. So I apologize if I got it wrong, Deandra. Deandra. Um, she's a pain medicine doc. She asked, you mentioned cannabis being equally effective in treating chronic pain as opioids. Opioids are horrible for treating neuropathic pain with the exception of methadone due to NMDA antagonism. Are there any pain types such as neuropathic pain that cannabis could be superior to opioids? Well, that's a really interesting question. I don't, I don't think we know yet. Um, most of the evidence for cannabis treating pain is for neuropathic pain. And I agree that um, opiates are not great for treating neuropathic pain. Honestly, nothing's great for treating neuropathic pain. Um, I remember when I had, I had spinal stenosis and I had surgery and I remember the opiates would take away like 10% of the pain and the cannabis would take away like a different 10% of the pain. And the Tylenol would take away a different 5% of the pain and the non steroidals would take away a different like 7% of the pain, but nothing really took it away. I mean, the beauty of cannabinoids is not only do they suppress the pain, but they also, um, affect the part of your brain that says this pain is noxious to me. So the pain you feel it, but it's not bothering you as much. So there, there are many different mechanisms, central, peripheral. So to get back to your question, um, I don't think, op there's very little evidence that opiates are good for long-term chronic pain. Most of the studies have been four, eight, 12 weeks. So I don't think we have very good evidence that anything works for chronic pain. But the main difference is we've studied the opiates to death and we've just scratching the surface of studying the cannabinoids. So who knows what we'll find, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if the cannabis were more effective, but we just haven't studied it because of 
you know, the drug wars really limited any funding and the schedule one has made very difficult any funding into benefits. But um, so I would say we have equal evidence for cannabis and opiates, yet cannabis hasn't been studied and opiates have. So there's a very good chance we're going to find that the answer to your question is yes, but we don't know that yet because we haven't proven it. <laughs> That's kind of a complicated answer. It's a complicated question. And uh, this is from Amy Reed. Amy Reed is, is uh, president of Kansas um, Cannabis Coalition and is doing a wonderful and very, being a very frustrating experience trying to get medical cannabis uh, through the Kansas legislature. Uh, she asks, in Kansas, lawmakers are waiting to keep or wanting to keep chronic pain off the list of qualifying conditions. They say anyone could get marijuana with just a hangnail. My response has been that the State Board of Healing Arts will monitor recommending physicians and prevent this from happening. In legal states, how hands-on are the licensing board? Do they watch for situations like this and prevent this from happening? Well, first of all, it's like chronic pain is the most common indication worldwide and in the US for using medical cannabis. So it's like completely brainless to like take that off the list. And sure, people can, can malinger. People can say they have pain when they don't have pain. Um, that happens with opiates. Uh, people do that for benzodiazepines. I don't see how it would be different with cannabis than for any other medication. Um, if anything, um, you know, they, they are pretty strict with the cannabis. They, you know, you have to check the prescription monitoring program and you have to have a quote unquote bona fide doctor patient relationship. So if you're a responsible physician, you know, there are these people that do card mills, just like there are pill mills. But if you're a responsible medical cannabis physician, you know, the patient you're following them and you wouldn't let that occur because I mean, I've uncertified patients that I thought were dealing it um, or not using it responsibly. So as long as someone's paying attention, that isn't a danger that isn't more of a danger or a concern as it would be for benzos or for opiates or for any other potentially harmful medication. It just is pure stigma that they're focusing on that for cannabis, but not focusing on it for these other medications, if you ask me. Yeah, I, I remember I've met a doc who was one of the early uh, docs who prescribed cannabis in Colorado. And she would prescribe to anybody. I, I, I mean, I was not happy with her at all, but she just thought that this, everybody should have access to it. And, um, and I, I know in Colorado, nobody's, nobody's watching that. And it would be really hard because everybody's got a little bit of pain. But everybody has access in Massachusetts now in 19 other states or 18 other states, 19 states total, because it's legal for adult use. I mean, part of the problem is that it put patients into a position if they wanted to use cannabis legally, they had to sort of come up with a medical problem. Um, so patients shouldn't do that. But at the same time, I think part of the problem is structural. If it were just legal, like alcohol, no one would be pretending to be ill because they'd have open access to it. So I think part of that is a you know, but it's interesting when I was a very new doctor, um, I suspected that a guy was scamming me for opiates. And so I followed him into the parking lot and two blocks away from the office, he stopped limping <laughs> and started walking perfectly well. This was like six months into being a doctor. And that was such a profound um, lesson for me. And I thought, you know, taking advantage of, but at the same time, I realized this guy's going to get opiates one way or another. And it's like doctors resent being the gatekeepers. Um, and, you know, it just became legalized medically before recreationally in most states because there's more of a chance of getting that passed through the legislature because almost everybody supports medical marijuana and only most people support recreational marijuana. So um, I, I do think this is a problem, but at the same time, I think it's a little bit of an artifactual problem that'll go away when we have full legalization, which is going to happen sometime in the next one to 10 years. Yeah, great point. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very impressed as a physician early on that you would follow a patient. To, to well, I had to know. I'm like, yeah. I just had to know if like this guy was scamming me or not. It was like really important to me because um, it, it, it really, it was such an educational thing to do. I don't know if it was like an ethical thing to do, but it was a very educational thing to do. And it like affected the rest of my medical career. Hmm. Um, 
Well, this will probably be the last question, um, but uh, but I because I don't want to keep anybody after. Um, actually, there's another one. So let's try and get two questions in. Alan uh, Alan Robbins asked, if just one person dies from an auto accident caused by a driver who is high, is it worth it? Well, that depends. I mean. I mean, it's not worth it to the person who dies, but it's worth it to the person who's, I mean, for society, it's a question of balancing harms and benefits. And there's a real harm to prohibition. I mean, we have like the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world or in the Western world. And we waste like a huge amount of money on law enforcement and traumatize all these people by, by um, criminalizing cannabis. We're harming people by doing that. So it's a question of sort of utilitarianism, like which is the lower harm, the occasional person that gets in a car accident. I mean, rates don't really go up when you legalize anyways. I mean, you could make the argument that it makes driving safer because the activity is not underground. People are transparent about it and they're able to say, we're using cannabis, let's get a designated driver. They know what they're getting from the dispensary. They're not just buying random stuff from the drug dealer. So. I mean, it actually makes it a lot safer to make it legalized in so many different ways. So the way the question is framed is sort of hard to answer because is it worth it to who? And if just one person dies, more than one person has already died, people do use cannabis and drive and crash and it's awful and they shouldn't. But it's really a question of education, not prohibition and criminalization. Um, and, you know, of course, if you're driving under the influence, that should be a, a criminal infraction, just like it is with alcohol. Uh, but, you know, no one's going to say we should make alcohol illegal because people get into drunk driving accidents. I mean, so there's sort of like um, tangential, related but tangential issues. So. Yeah. And, and I mean, you could say the same thing about uh, texting on cell phones or even talking on cell phones or being tired or taking benzos or, or any sedative. Uh, right. I mean, I was we just all... reading an article where like, you know, exactly, antihistamines. Uh, so many medications people take, antidepressants, uh, increase your risk of accidents as much as cannabis does. So I just think we need to be consistent. I don't understand why people hyper-focus on cannabis and just ignore the dangers of all these other things. Um, it seems like a real double standard. I agree. And, and I think uh, Deandra had the last question. Um, and, and I think it's similar to the previous question. It's not that it's kind of, how do we respond to our, our colleagues and other, other people who are posing these questions to us? Uh, and Deandra specifically says, to our physician colleagues who say you are just exchanging one addictive substance for another, what do you say? Well, you're not. I mean, you are and you aren't. It's like, can it's a different type of addiction first of all someone who's been addicted to opiates like people don't rob pharmacies or injure themselves to get cannabis like opiate addiction is so much more all-consuming than cannabis addiction second of all cannabis is much less addictive than either alcohol or tobacco uh, which are legal so according to their logic we should criminalize alcohol and tobacco nobody's willing to do that again this is just internalized stigma from 50 years of the drug war it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. Um, and if you're substituting a more harmful substance for a less harmful substance, that's called harm reduction. That's a great thing. That's why we use Suboxone or buprenorphine. Suboxone is an addictive opiate, but it's much more, so is methadone, but they're much safer than using heroin and fentanyl on the street. So I think that's actually a really nonsensical argument, unlike across the board from beginning to end. Okay. Thank you, Peter. This was excellent. I enjoyed it. I think everyone did. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending. The FCR thanks you. <laughs>